as we continue with our study of Hebrews, we again come to the end of a section and we start a new section. So it's good to do a little reminder of how the book has been going. So if you remember when we started with chapter one and the theme of the book we said is to show Christ is greater than everything. And we said specifically the recipients were Jewish Hebrew Christians who were struggling both internally and externally. Internally because of the tribulation and the suffering that they were going through, externally because of the Jews who were with them, who were forcing them to go back to aspects of Judaism, them themselves getting into confusion about what was right. And when you saw through that, you might have realized that after chapter one, when we discuss that Jesus is greater than angels, then chapter two, we come to the point when we ask the question, how can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Then we go on to a couple more chapters. Then we come to chapter four. We again come to a warning passage. Then we come to chapter five. When we are told that you have to be mature, that you cannot go back to basic doctrines like resurrection and baptism. Because at that time, he's going to speak about a very important topic about Jesus being, he's already spoken about Jesus being high priest, but now he's going to speak about Jesus being greater than Melchizedek. And all the rules of the Jewish laws, which apply to the high priest, as Melchizedek was greater, Jesus is much more greater than Melchizedek. And the moment that passage gets over and we come to a new topic, he's again going to go into a series of times when we have to check and evaluate ourselves. This is important because the true test of faith, the true test of understanding of theology comes when you get understanding in practical aspects. The true strength of a Christian, if it really is under doctrine, comes, as Brother explained to us, in the fear of the Lord, being seen in true piety. It cannot be seen um, many times the piety that people show uh, or the humbleness that people show is, trust me, not humbleness, but rather pride. It is shown as humbleness, but it is not humbleness, but it is pride. I'm saying this because we have this habit of understanding things in the wrong context. There would be many times when, when you discuss with people and you would like people say, uh, you know, brother, we don't want to discuss about doctrine because this would lead to a fight. Or brother, why should we actually check people? Can we not get on with our lives and not do good because this is acted to be or shown to be an act of humbleness, but in actuality, it is a great amount of pride in which a person does not want to change his stance. So don't mix it up. Right? When people tell you that they want everyone to live in peace and so that we should not squabble about doctrines, it is pride. Because if he really wants to learn about something and he wants to change his stance, he would be happy. Now we come to a portion like well, in chapter nine, chapter 10, like we have already spoken about what Christ has done. We spoke about what Christ has lived for and as a high priest, he has gone into the holy place to offer himself once. Then we spoke from Jeremiah 31 again and we said that how God has put his word, his covenant into our hearts. That word has come into our hearts in Christ. Now we go ahead and we look at verse 19 to 21. In fact, it's a large section, uh, but I want to take the small section before we go to the major areas there. Let's look at verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, must only do. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and a body is washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of faith 
without wavering or is faithful that promise and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as he say the day approaching and when you read the passage after that that's again a warning given to the congregation now let's understand why i think this almost close of that matter after discussing everything about what christ is saying he now comes to the conclusion that having therefore brethren having therefore brethren that strong concept of brotherhood which is not just a physical brotherhood here is a concept of believers united together in christ because what is going to say after this is going to require a good amount of understanding what brothers should do together if the idea of brotherhood is not there all that comes later will fall, fall flat in fact if you have gone to if you go back to verse 22 22 23 24 what are the common things that you read and write it the outset 22 what are the common things that you read let us let us let us if the idea of brotherhood is not there what is going to speak after this would make no sense because if the us is not there there would not be an idea of working together so the idea of christian brotherhood is extremely important in which not only natural affections but that spiritual affections is seen in a person because it's christ who's in every person the holy spirit in every person so that the, the way we treat each other is understanding christ being in that person there's a serious urgency in how we look at that matter there's a serious urgency how we see a believer in need both physically as well as spiritually what is missing in our churches is this urgency towards our brother what's missing in our churches is this idea of a church and the brotherhood of the church which is out in the open for people to see that's missing uh, probably when we when, when we finish the end there would be i would like to discuss a concept of marriage which has been floating around i've discussed this probably all uh, uh, before also but I, i think it's it's a good thing to discuss the importance of the idea that the marriage should happen inside a church is is something that we'll come back to because it's it's connected how we treat each other now let's look at the second thing so first it is brethren now then it says let's go back to verse 19 having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus now this is important we understood earlier that the blood of bulls and rams do not really on its own take away any one sin it was always the work the work of christ but even when the believers in the old testament understood saving grace that boldness which we see now is not seen in the old testament that boldness that they had is not seen in the old testament the, the, the greek word there is almost in, in some sense you can use the word blunt it's almost like blunt he is bold enough to go out with some uh, translations use the word outspoken i mean you can be so bold you can be right there you can be outspoken so most of the translation use the word bold so you can be there openly not hiding you can be there openly in front of god now no longer are you going to be scared that the devil or death might stop you no longer you're going to be scared that god is going to strike you down but i want to explain boldness to you with a warning i'm following up with what the thomas spoke one of the things that's lacking in our churches is boldness at the same time what is lacking in our churches is the fear of god because the idea of boldness is completely strange what these people are doing they are bold enough to the point that they think there is no need to fear god anymore that's not what the, the author is trying to tell me here he is saying now you can go into the holiest of holies openly 
If you remember the priest who went into the Holy of Holies, all the people, this is the priest. So how were the remaining people shown? And the priest went in. How were the remaining people shown when the priest went in? How were the 12 tribes shown when the priest went in? Only the priest went, right? Yes. Understood. There were the stones representing each tribe. So they went in, the, only when the priest went in, the others were symbolically presented inside. But now there is no need for you to be symbolically present. You can openly go in front of God. But I want you to remember this, that boldness does not mean the character of God has changed. Can you come down to the end of the chapter? Chapter 10. In Kevin, can read the verse. Yes. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Okay. Uh, chapter 12, sorry, the Lord is the verse. You have, not the end of the verse, you have in 12, which or towards the end when you find people falling away and God judging them, it is in Hebrews you'll find that God is a consuming fire. The boldness that we approach God does not change the character of God. He is still a consuming fire. The boldness is something that the Old Testament people could not have. Now, in the morning, we read a passage, if you remember, we read from Genesis 15. Uh, some of you all were not there. If you want to quickly turn to Genesis 15, if, uh, it's, it's one of my, beautiful, my most beautiful passages for me in scripture. Uh, the late R.C. Sproul uh, says if the entire Bible was ever taken from him and he was allowed to keep one page from the Bible, he says Genesis 15 would be that page that he will keep. You look at Genesis 15. It's an interesting chapter. The Abram, not Abraham, Abram is still complaining. And God makes a covenant with Abram. Right? Now this chapter, I believe, is very close to Genesis 15. How will come in a moment, but let's look at the passage again. Let's verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So the only way we can stand in front of God is by the blood of Jesus, who, now here's interesting, by a new and living way, which is consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, by a new and living way, which is consecrated for us, that is. Now, look, look, at, the, look at the order of words. First of all, we said church, this whole thing is given to the brethren, the brotherhood, right? Now, at times it becomes very confusing, right? Because book of Hebrews, warnings are given to the same group of people. Good things are told to the same group of people. How do we understand? Israel is there and all the things are being again told to Israel that you would be killed. Some words we saw very, we saw very clearly know these are only given to reprobates. And that's something that you need to understand every time you look at the book of Hebrews, that the church is an organic bunch. A church is an organic group in which there will be both wheat as well as tares. That's important. One of the things that we always need to remember is that famous words from John chapter 15. It says, the vine and the branches. Remember that? If anyone who is in me and does not bear fruit, my father will cut it away. But here's the problem with that verse. How can someone be in Christ and not bear fruit? So we understand that people could be a part of the church, part of the things that the church do, but still would not bear fruit. And so the difficulty of the passages immediately escapes us 
or if anything goes away from us, then you understand it's a mixed group. So it's a mixed group, we can still give a warning. In a mixed group of a church, we can still tell people, you will go to hell if you do not understand and believe Christ. You understand this? That's the reason the church becomes the right place that we should give people the warning that it's required. It's weak and tears, which the God tells us. So every warning section is important for us to understand. Well, let's come back to our passage, Genesis 15. God appeared to Abraham. And when Abraham, God told Abraham, let's do this. Let's cut animals into, into two parts. And if you remember, that's how the treaties were done in the old times. When two kings wanted to give an assurance that they would make a treaty or they would keep their part of the treaty, here's what agreement they would do. They would get animals, they'll cut the animals into two, they'll keep it on two sides of, and they create something like a passage and the king would pass through the passage. The idea was to show that if any one of them breaks the treaty, to them, they will become like the animal that has been cut and killed. You understand this? So when the animals were kept, cut it to two. So now God is going to make a covenant with Abraham. God tells him, take animals, do what? Cut them in two. Covenant has to be signed between two people. Who has to pass through? Both Abraham as well as God. If you go back to the passage, what happens to Abraham? God put Abraham into to sleep. It doesn't end there. What else? No, no. Look at that passage where Abraham fell asleep. Can you see that? There is fear. There is. Can someone read that? And horror of great darkness fell upon him. Abraham would not go through that. God put Abraham to sleep and the whole event was a horror of darkness which was there. And then God went right through that as a fire. Indicating what? If the covenant is broken, God would die. You understand that? If the covenant would be broken as if God would be killed. It was to indicate that God in no way is going to break the covenant. In no way, Abraham would not get what God has promised him. Because God says he is the one who is going to be killed if the covenant is not kept. Now come back to our passage. Let's look at the beauty of what has been in front of us. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Okay, first let's look at the word new. And the word new here is only used in the New Testament in this place. It is almost means a freshly sacrificed animal or something which is freshly killed. Now look at almost the I don't like the word paradox, but look, it's almost two contradictory ideas. A freshly killed, and then you find a living way. The new and living way, a freshly killed, as if Christ was freshly killed for this purpose, so that he can create what? A living way for us. That's what Christianity is all about. That we cannot save ourselves. The biggest difference between Christianity and every religion in the world, every religion in the world is this, including atheism, if you understand that as a religion, is that man cannot save himself. The entire process of salvation is taken by God. The first step is taken by God. And when God requires a person to be killed, it's as if Jesus Christ, as a freshly killed, became a living way 
which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now we all know this. When the, the, the curtain was torn, indicating what? The curtain was torn, indicating what? That we could? But that was not all that it showed. What does it was indicate? The curtain was torn, indicating what? Christ was slaughtered. That's what it indicates. Christ was slaughtered. So there is no way a person now cannot enter into the Holy of Holies because Christ, like the veil, has been slaughtered. In fact, it's difficult to sometimes comprehend this, but it almost looks like Christ, till the time he was living and he would not die, he would be the person who's standing there between us and God. And that's what he always was. He was the mediator standing between us and God, but in this time, literally like a veil, torn down in his flesh by a new and living way which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now what happened when he was torn down? But when he was torn down, this is what we get. And having a high priest over the house of God. So brethren, you have boldness to come in front of Christ because now you have a high priest who literally in his flesh was torn down so that we can come to God in boldness by doing nothing on our own self. That's Christian religion. And it's immensely difficult for people to understand. It's immensely difficult for people to accept. When we were studying the doctrine of divine decree, why is Calvinism so, why do people get so angry when we discuss Calvinism? Why do people get so angry when we tell them that God is the one who saves? Why? Because it's one doctrine that shows man who he really is, helpless, unable to save himself. The moment you tell them it is God who's going to save you, this is not acceptable to man who wants to have some kind of a participation in his salvation. Right? So the moment you tell them, no, you cannot save yourself, you are such a wretched state, all that your hands are going to touch is going to be sin that's not acceptable to man because man somehow thinks he is good, he can do something good. But Christianity breaks it down saying it is Christ who was crucified and it is Christ alone because he was torn down. You can enter into, Christ, into the holiest of holies. I keep saying this and we come to that topic when we, God willing next week. That the only assurance that a Christian has is Christ. There are people who, who tell you that we get assurance by the works that we do. When we do good works, that gives us assurance. Now, let me remind you, and you come back into our passage, and if you read verse 24, 23 and 24, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for it's faithful that promise. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and unto good works. Good works are essential for a Christian. But let me assure you, from good works, you cannot get assurance. The only assurance a Christian has is in the gospel and in the, in the gospel of Christ. In all that Christ has done. So that is when you look at the verses, because you know there is a high priest in verse 21. Verse 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance. If Christ is not the high priest over the house of God, you cannot have assurance. Because then every day we'll be keep trying to clean our own closets, our own way. Every day we'll try to land up becoming more holy in our own way, thinking that is the way God will make us stand in front of him. And that would never help. A Christian does what he does because he's sure that the assurance that comes to him comes because of Christ. Now let's look at that again, verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God. 
that's what we are we are the house of god you can call yourself as the kingdom of god so what we going to be learning next week is do you really understand what you are the house of god and if you really are the house of god are you behaving as members of the house of god as a church that's what we're going to look at that we have a role to play in the house of god there's no one here who can say i do not have a role to play and if we read through that you'll understand so as a prime let's, let's quickly read from verse 21 you will read the whole thing again having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus by the new freshly sacrificed and a living way which he had consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having a high priest over the house of god let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for it is faithful that promise and let us consider one another to promote unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching a christian is not someone who can sit outside the church there there cannot be a christian who does not think that the church is not the center of his life not peripheral not peripheral and i we have said this time and again people think that church is one of the institutions that they have to join it is the primary institution of which you are a part of every other institution you choose to join in the church you god has elected you and brought you inside that's one institution where you are a part of you cannot escape and you want to go out that would only be an apostle the desire to be inside the church to work for the church is what we're going to study next time as a passing what we spoke about about marriage uh, i spoke about this earlier but i wanted to get in this this context uh, here you would be hearing uh, certain people possibly online who speak about the marriage vow between did we discuss this issue no okay uh, there was someone uh, in from from our earlier churches uh, were there with us a uh, silas if you remember and uh, so they have a doctrine that if two people are mature enough in christ and if they give a marriage vow to each other if the man gives a marriage vow to a girl and the girl gives a marriage vow to a man and says they agree to marry each other then it happens that they are now married You getting what I'm saying, or did I confuse you in the whole thing? That means a girl and a boy together. If they decide to get married and they promise each other that they are going to get married and they're given vows to each other, they're Christians. Then they are married. Yes or no? I mean, we have got already fathers of daughters here who would be thinking, "What is the kind of rubbish this is going to happen?" And it's going to be an absolutely scary. time to think of right is it really a marriage why not they are christians and for a christian a yes should be yes and a no should be no so why is if a girl and a boy promises that they have to get married shouldn't it be considered to be a marriage when people do not know which side to turn now wouldn't that be better why is it required no i'm saying why is it required i'm playing the devil's advocate on the other side that's the reason please attend our marriage sessions that we do for everyone and even when we have a marriage remember this that there is a marriage did, did how many people attended when we had Uh, Clifford's wedding. 
okay, we have this small booklet of marriage. I want you to, you'll find it, you can read through it. And when we have this marriage booklet, there's something that you need to understand here. That the first thing that Samir asks is, who is giving this girl in marriage? Now the question is not asked to the boy. The question is asked to the girl's father. Who gives the girl in marriage is the father. If you remember the Old Testament, there was a rule. Even if two people come together for marriage, the girl goes back and tells the father that she wants to get married to the guy, the boy. The father would evaluate the person, see how he's working, look at the amount of money that he has. And then if it does not like that person, he would say, no, that marriage is not going to work. Marriage is a covenant between two people which could be seen. What you saw here was the idea of boldness. I said, it is public, it is not done in secret. When a boy and a girl will tell each other that they are going to get married, and when this question was asked, my immediate response was, maybe you have seen too many old Hindi movies. When two people, even when the priest is not there, marry in front of the temple, in front of the idol, and then they decide that now they are happily married. And then you have a whole list of agony that goes back. A boy who does not want to show his wife in front of the people does not have good intentions to begin with. Marriage, and when we come to chapter, into Hebrews, we'll understand that, that the bed is holy among everyone. It's a covenant. So when someone tells you, no, no, two people are good enough for marriage, here's what they're trying to show. They're trying to show that the church is not important. The believing community is not important. What is only important is the person on himself. Marriage gets its sanctity from the covenant, from the house of God in which it stands. You understand this? Now the first statement that there are two people, two mature people, their yes should be yes, their no can be no, they're Christians, it's piety, it's false humbleness. It is not obeying what the Bible tells you to obey. The reason I put this forward is there are rules and regulations that work in the house of God, which are which everyone in the church has to obey. So when we come to the passage that we're talking about next time, it is not a simple choice that I choose to do this or I do not choose to do this. It's, it's my choice whether I really want to be a part of this, of this activity. You cannot be. You are in the church. You are a part of the household. You cannot say a particular activity of the church does not affect you. It just cannot be. Sadly, there at least we are functioning right now. A lot of things are still wanting. The way we are functioning right now, we hardly see each other more than a week. Once in a week, that's all that we meet. A few of us again meet for the Bible study. That's not even a right way to function. But as a family, the church will have a responsibility, each other, to build each other up continuously, and no one can say they are not a part of it. But why does it all come to? Let's go back to our thing and let's. So let's go back, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by that which is dead and living, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, having a high priest over the house of God, let us therefore draw near, let us therefore assemble, let us therefore do everything to build each other up. Are you really believing in Christ? What is your view of the church of God? If you really believe in Christ, what is the view how the church gets built up? The Belgic Confession, one of the creeds that we strongly follow, makes this very important statement. It says this, do not interact or do not be with people who do not go to churches. Right? This is not about an unbelieving person. 
This is supposed to be about a believing person who says a believer but does not become a part of the church. And the Belgian Confession says, do not be with that person who does not think church is fundamental to his life because that will destroy your own. We are Christians because God has given a son whose body was thrown on the cross to make us as the household of God. And since we are the household of God, all that we're going to do from now on, what we're going to speak about now on, we have each one a role to fulfill. Let God enable us to think about our roles as we study that further. Let's just pull on in prayer. A new and a living way. We would never understand this. Never understand what the new is. A freshly killed sacrifice. So we could never come to you. We who are thrown out in every manner could become a part of the church of God. You made your son to be torn for us. That we could raise up our hands today and reach out to you in some manner to touch you. Because we know we can to your son. And know we will be healed. Like the woman who was bleeding. Though she was shivering in fear. She knew she would be healed. Help us, Lord, as to think about the boldness, but never to forget the trembling. As we think about the boldness to be in your kingdom, help us, Lord, to understand that we have to tremble as we work out our salvation. Help us, Lord, to tremble when we think about sin. Help us, Lord, to tremble when we think about disobeying you. Help us, Lord, to tremble when we fear man more than you. Help us, Lord, to tremble to know you are a judge and you will judge. And each heart here, O oh Master, Yet the boldness of knowing your son has died for us. And we are washed. We can come within the veil with boldness. For nothing that we have done, but what your son has done. Let no man-made religion take away that joy of Christ from us. Let our assurance be your son. His work, that's the gospel. Now the greatest joy, if someone asks us, how do you know you are saved? Let us always happily say it is his work. Jesus Christ, the son of God, died on the cross for my sins. And he paid the price. He tore the way. And I have boldness to say this. I'm saved and I'll be in heaven. I will not be burnt when I stand in front of the great God. Because Jesus Christ died for me. But help us, Master, to understand that when your son died for us, he bought us, he made us into a household of God. Of which your son is the high priest. Help us, Lord, each one understand our responsibilities in this household. 
as we study further what proves us to be a household of faith. We pray, Master, that you keep teaching us and you make your spirit so much in our life dominant that we understand rightly and we behave rightly with your holy fear. In your son's name, we offer this prayer. Amen.